This video is sponsored by Opus. Recently I stumbled across some images online that show a World War II era concept for an early version of what we would know of today as terrain following radar. The airplane is equipped with a long surface following probe that allows it to follow the contour of the ground. In this video I'm going to try recreating this idea with an RC plane. But I'm not doing this just because it's cool, it's for a reason. We'll get to that later. If you watch my videos then you'll know I've been obsessed with the ground effect recently. I've built all types of ground effect vehicles, and the one thing they all have in common is that they have a deep wing cord. If you don't know, a wing's cord is the length from the leading edge to the trailing edge. So this plane has a very thin cord, and this one has a very thick cord, or deep cord. I have primarily been sticking with deep cord designs because, in my experience, deep cords seem to create a stronger ground effect. The plane feels more like it's riding on a high-pressure bubble of air up against the surface of the water, which is great, but there are some downsides to a deep cord. For one, it's less efficient than a wing with a thinner cord. That's why super efficient gliders have such thin wings. Also, if you go with a deeper cord, then your plane is going to end up with a shorter wingspan, and they say that the altitude at which the ground effect can be felt is dependent on the length of the aircraft's wingspan. So this plane, with its nice long wingspan, should in theory be able to start feeling the ground effect at a much higher altitude than this plane with its little stubby wingspan. For these experiments, I'm going to be using the FMS Fox, it's a foam motor glider with a 2.3 meter wingspan. My first impression of this plane is that it flies extremely well. Wow, <laughs> that thing's a floater. I think the light wing loading helps a lot. A lot of sources say the ground effect starts being noticeable at about half an aircraft's wingspan above the ground. Since this plane has a 2.3 meter wingspan, that means I should start to feel the ground effect at just over a meter high. And I barely feel anything. Now you can see why I'm wanting to try out the train following radar idea. But just because I can't feel the ground effect doesn't mean it's not there. I'm going to try measuring the efficiency increase gained from flying low. And to do that, I'll need a flight controller. So I installed ArtyPilot in this plane. The radio's on the ground. No hands. Just doing its own thing. Pretty sweet. What do you do when you forgot your drone for air-to-air -air video? Just throw your camera. I didn't only want to fly this plane over grass, I also wanted to fly it over the water, so I started gluing foam onto the bottom to form a pontoon that the plane could float on. I poured in some polyurethane foam for extra strength and buoyancy. Oh god, it's coming. <laughs> I used way too much. To keep the wingtips from digging into the water, I glued on some chunks of foam to act as hydroplaning surfaces. Since this plane didn't seem to have much of a natural tendency to stay in the ground effect, I decided to install this little waterproof sonar sensor in the underside of the fuselage to measure the height above the water. When paired with Sebastian's custom ArduPilot surface following code, this should enable the plane to fly itself at a pre-programmed height. So with that, it was off to the lake for the first test. Luckily, it still flew really well with all the extra stuff I added on, although it definitely did feel a bit less efficient than before. Upon switching it into surface following mode with sonar control, it just kind of dove down into the water. Ah, should have brought a paddle. <laughs> it sits in the water really nicely. I just need to move the motor, then it'll probably be able to take off from the water. I think the reason why the ground effect sonar mode didn't work on the first try is because the controller was severely overtuned. You can see here how the elevator is moving a huge amount as the height above the ground changes. Probably too much of a response. Oh, and I also drilled holes in the servos and filled them with corrosion X to prevent them from getting water damaged. Corrosion X is basically just like sticky oil that covers the electronics so that water can't touch them. Later that day we took the plane out on my boat to hopefully tune the surface following flight controller better. Flying this plane next to my boat is really fun. There was almost no wind on this day and the air was super smooth. The water on the other hand was really rough from all the other boat waves. It was tough for the boat to keep up with the plane without getting smashed by waves. After having a little fun, I brought the plane down low and flipped it into the sonar mode. It actually worked this time. I had turned down the elevator controller gains quite a bit, but it still seemed to be oscillating. At least it wasn't crashing into the water though. I was getting chased by seagulls, must have been in their airspace. So I would land, adjust the altitude controller parameters, test and repeat, over and over again. I tried all sorts of P, I and D combinations, but nothing really seemed to get rid of the low frequency altitude oscillations. I also tried using the throttle to control height instead of the elevator, and that didn't seem to help either. <laughs> Touch and go with the prop only. Oh, I saw a little wake on the water. So being able to land this plane on the water was nice, but I also wanted to be able to take off from the water. 
so I took the motor out of the nose and 3D printed this swan neck looking motor extender thing. That just screws into the old motor mount and then the motor attaches to the top. Since the motor is now up above the center of drag, I gave it a positive 5 degree angle to counteract any negative pitching moment arm that was created. Then it was back to the lake for a test. As you can see, it worked pretty well. This would allow me to do test flights from the beach, which was convenient because I didn't have to take my boat out every time I wanted to work on tuning the altitude controller, which I did, and I was still unable to completely get rid of the altitude oscillations. I think this control loop has worked decently well for me in the past because it was paired with an aircraft that already had a natural self-stabilizing feedback loop to stay in the ground effect, so adding the control loop on top of that would just be the little bit of help it needed to resist disturbances. But with this plane, there is no self-stabilizing ground effect feedback loop, and the sonar controller isn't good enough to do everything on its own. I'm not sure if that's because the sonar sensor is too slow or what. But despite this, I still decided to take the plane out of my boat during a calm morning and try and get some efficiency measurements. I also brought the deep cord pixel configuration airframe out to have a little fun with, but ended up almost running it over. But that's another story. <laughs> so with the ground effect glider, I was hoping that I could reduce the altitude controller gains enough to stop the oscillation, but then just manually trim the throttle to hopefully keep it at the right height. This seemed like it might be likely to work because I was in the middle of the lake with presumably very little turbulence and plenty of space just to fly in big huge circles without needing to make any abrupt maneuvers. It kind of worked, but unfortunately the plane would still just kind of nick the water every now and then. And it would also climb up to a meter or more high, so this data certainly isn't going to be perfect, but hopefully it shows something. Here you can even see the arrow wake from the little jets of downwash coming off of the floats. The floats have nice steep angles on them and end up kicking air downwards extra fast. So after flying low for quite a while, I went up high to get out of ground effect and collect some data from normal flight. And here's what the data looks like. We're using watt hours per kilometer to measure the efficiency. The reason the line looks kind of wavy is because I was flying in giant circles across the lake, and it was going upwind and downwind, and upwind and downwind. This is just one of the flights, but if we average out all the circles and add in data from the other flights, we get about a 0.92 watt hour per kilometer efficiency measurement. Here's the data from out of ground effect. This data isn't quite as consistent because I was manually adjusting the throttle to keep the plane at the right altitude, but it seems to average out to a little over one watt hour per kilometer. So that means that flying low was 8% more efficient than flying high. Pretty interesting. So after that, I thought it might be interesting to try and visualize the difference between a thick and a thin cord as they travel through the air. So I brought a fog machine and a line laser out to the field at night. There happens to already be some natural fog hanging around, so now we have double fog. You can see the droplets suspended in the air next to this high power LED light. Pretty cool. So this whole idea did not even come close to working well enough to compare the aerodynamic differences between the two wing shapes, but we did at least get some cool looking visuals. And we also managed to capture some wingtip vortexes on camera. You can really see just how much rotational energy there is in the air. There was an ever so slight amount of breeze on this night and it kept changing direction, so I had to get really lucky with the position of the plumes of fog and the camera angle to be able to see the vortices. Then I switched over to the fox. Look at this tight little vortex rolling along. What really amazed me is just how long the vortices would last for. Look, here's another one, from the other wingtip, just now making its way across to the laser. It's still spinning. I even had time to turn the plane around and fly back through before the rotational movement had even ended. Unfortunately, the fog... The breeze and my flight paths were just too inconsistent to really be able to draw any conclusions here, but it would be cool to someday put smoke generators on the plane and see if we can visualize what's happening with the ground effect that way. I'll add it to my to-do list. Okay, I'm gonna pack it up and get out of here before I get eaten by a ghost. Oh, something just touched my leg. That was a stick. If you're wondering how I made so much fog in the middle of a field, here's a hint. It wasn't with a vape. <laughs> If you want to blow clouds this thick, you don't need a vape. What you need is an Opus Mega 3 and a 1100 watt fog machine. I've tested a lot of these big power stations and the Opus Mega 3 is by far the most powerful. It has a 3072 watt hour battery capacity and a pure sine wave inverter that can handle 3600 watts of continuous output. These things are super convenient. I use them all the time. Whether it's out on my boat or for film shoots like this one, the Opus Mega 3 is basically just like bringing the power grid with you wherever you go. You can charge it from the wall in a little over an hour, and you can also charge it from solar panels or your car's DC output. It even has wheels and an extendable handle like a suitcase, making transportation easy. On the front panel of the Mega 3, there are 6 AC outputs, 6 USB DC outputs, and 4 12 volt DC outputs, so you'll never run out of ports to charge all your devices with. Oh yeah, I forgot to take this off. 
Whenever I'm spending the day at the lake to work on a project, I bring the Mega 3 along to power my computer and charge the drone batteries. If I really need a lot of power, I can even expand its capabilities with solar panels. Opus offers these awesome foldable 240 watt panels, and with four of them you can fully charge the Mega 3 in one day. Opus is also running a public welfare program called Opus Help. This initiative aims to provide sustainable energy solutions and financial assistance to those in need. If you're interested in the Mega 3, click on the link in the description to help support this channel and use my discount code to get 15% off. Thanks again to Opus for sponsoring this video. So now back to the daylight. The sonar control loop still wasn't doing a very good job at keeping the plane at the right altitude, so that's when I decided to try out the dangling wand idea. It's also worth noting that hydrofoil sailboats use a similar mechanism to control their height above the water. Now I already did make a video about trying this concept on my speedboat ground effect vehicle, and it worked pretty well, but installing it on a real airplane is going to be quite a bit different. So the first thing I did to design a surface following wand is take a 3D scan of the nose of the airplane. This is the 3D Maker Pro Lynx scanner. This was my first time ever using a 3D scanner, and it's pretty cool. After post-processing, I can bring this model into Onshape and use it to get all the critical angles and whatnot that I need to design the parts. That helps me design these gears that will then connect the canards and wands. Oh, by the way, Onshape is free for hobbyists, and if you want to access any of the files in this video, just click on the link in the description. Then you'll have full access to the native designs, so you can roll back through it and see exactly how I designed each part, or modify them for your own use. After the CAD was done, I SLA printed all the parts on the Form 3 Plus and installed them on the airplane. This is what we ended up with. Here you can see a video of it working. As the airplane goes up and down, it pushes on the wands, which rotate the canards to hopefully cause the plane to go up and down. This is a pretty far out concept, but will it work? Let's find out. Here you can see that the canards do change angle as the plane nears the ground, so that's a good start. After another pass or two, it became clear that the control loop was too powerful. The altitude was oscillating once again. To reduce the strength of the response, I cut some foam from the canards. That really didn't seem to help all that much. I didn't want to just extend the wands any longer because after a certain point they just get impractically long. So then I cut them down even smaller. Same story, it was still kind of bouncing off the ground. Eventually I had them cut down to just little slivers, and at this point it definitely seemed to have a weakened response, but now the controller just felt way too loose, like it didn't have enough control authority to even come close to working. So that was a bit of a bummer, but I wasn't going to give up just yet. Next I decided to try kind of repurposing the wand mechanisms into flap control instead of canard control. When the airplane is flying like normal, the flaps will be slightly up, like spoilers. Then as the plane nears the ground, the flaps lower to generate more lift. Hopefully this results in a self-stabilizing feedback loop. Here you can see the mechanism is at least mechanically working, the flaps lower as it nears the ground. But will it properly control the altitude? Eh, unfortunately it didn't really seem to work. I think the problem here is that the pitch and the airspeed have such a huge effect on altitude that the flaps really can't affect it all that much. They might have kind of been redirecting the plane upwards a little bit, but even then it would just kind of bounce up too high and start an oscillation. It's tough to say what's really going on here. Despite it not working very well, I still thought it might be fun to try out on water. So here it is, on water. The results were the same, the flaps didn't really seem to quell its sporadic altitude tendencies, but it was still cool to see the wands dragging across the surface of the water. So from these experiments, and just the last few years of messing around with ground effect vehicles in general, it's become clear that the surface following aircraft problem is a really hard one to solve. By far the best way to do it seems to be to just design an aircraft that is more sensitive to the ground effect and has a stronger natural tendency to ride on the high pressure bubble of air it builds. Actively controlling the altitude does still seem like a fun problem to try and solve, though it's definitely beyond my skill set. If you're a control systems engineer and want a challenge, hit me up. So what have I learned from all this? I'd say that it's the thinner wing cords can still benefit from the ground effect, but the ground effect isn't as noticeable to the pilot. The ground effect is definitely more noticeable with deeper wing cords, but what I'm not sure of is whether the efficiency gains are proportional to the strength of the self-stabilizing altitude feedback loop. Like, for example, the ground effect is probably like five times more noticeable with my deep cord aircraft, but I'm not sure if the efficiency gains are also like five times higher when it's flying low. It's definitely something I could test, but we'll have to wait for a future video to see. The wing cord length has a big influence on the strength of the ground effect, but it's not the only thing. The scale of the aircraft also has a huge effect. This is the FMS Ranger. It has a 1200mm wingspan and I can't feel the ground effect at all with this thing. I know full scale seaplane pilots can definitely feel it, even with the wings way up high off the water because of the floats, but with this little plane it's just not noticeable at all. It might be more noticeable if I took the wing off the top and attached it to the bottom of the fuselage. Hmm, that's actually an interesting idea, maybe I should try it. Anyways, that's all for this video, thanks for watching, bye.